Welcome back children. Let's continue the discussion. In lesson number one so far, we dealt only with discrete charges. So what do we mean by that? Like we dealt only with point charges. You see, there is a charge here, there is a point here. And then if we, even when we consider the system of charges, we say, so this is Q1 and this is Q2 and this is Q3 and this is Q4 and so on. So we consider only the point charges as a system, as a collection of point charges we call as a system. So these, this setup and these charges they are called as discrete charges. Okay, this is a system of discrete charges because they are not continuous. There is a point charge here, another point charge here, third here, and then fourth there. So they are discrete. So we call them as discrete charges. And this is a system of discrete charges. But in reality, this may not be the case. For example, if we take a plate and if I, uh, if I give charge to it, if I take a metal plate and give a charge to it, then the charge is going to be distributed over the surface of the plate and uniformly. Think about it. So it is it's no longer, I can't treat that the surface as a, as a collection of discrete charges. Yes, at the, if you think about it, at the bottom of it all, you have to go back to the electrons, right, which, which are the, the basic units of charge, E, so, which is equal to 1.602 in the 10 power minus 19 Coulomb. That's a basic unit, but we also discussed that when lots and lots of them are put together, then they will look like continuous charges. The example that I told you was was a, was a wall, and here even if you take this glass, so you have you know that like this is it's not continuous, right? Like you have many molecules which have come together to make it. So it's not continuous basically, but it appears to be continuous. I should I should still be able to find number of molecules in this area of glass. I should be able to do that, or this volume of glass, think about it. But we don't look at it that way, we look at it as, as a continuous distribution of, of the material. here. So this is the glass, the glass is continuous here, and the board is continuous here. But are they really continuous? No. But that is not the point. And we are concerned, for all practical purposes, about Continuous charge distribution, not a discrete charge distribution. Now, that is not what you see um, in practice. In, 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 uh, in, in, in practical life, you don't see a single electron here and then there and there. It's not like that. Again, when you charge something, when you take a conductor and then you charge that conductor, then the charge is going to be uniformly distributed, approximately, assuming that it is uniformly. Uh, it's, it's very smooth and all that. It's when the charge is going to be distributed on the surface of a conductor. So we have to be focusing on continuous charge distribution. So far, we are talking only about discrete charges. Now we will talk about continuous charge distribution because that is what you see in real life. Like a glass uh, window or, or the board or the wall. So, the continuous distribution is what you are concerned about. Okay. Uh, so, so, this is this is discrete. You call them as discrete charges. Well, then, like you have, if you take a surface, okay, then all these charges, is a surface full of charges, let's say. Full of charges. So I can call this as continuous charge distribution. It can be a surface or even if you take a line, a line full of charges. Okay, continuous charges. Likewise, I can take a volume also. Maybe I can take a sphere, a sphere full of charges. So I can have a linear charge distribution 
I can have an aerial or a surface charge distribution or a volume charge distribution. Okay, so I am no longer dealing with discrete charges. This is what I am going to talk about now. So this is called as a continuous, continuous charge distribution. So what is important in this? Like if I have a continuous charge distribution, then what should I go for? Well, I should go for density. The density idea is obvious in the case of volume. Well, if I know that um, so much charge is there in a certain volume of sphere, then I can very easily calculate the charge density for the volume. Just like we call, we, we calculate the mass density, right? If we take uh, this material for example, the, how do you find density of this material? Well, I'm going to find the volume of it and I'm also going to weigh this and find the mass of it. The mass divided by volume will give me the density of this material, the average density of this material. Okay. Uh, likewise, if I have a volume of charges, then I should be able to find the volume density of the charge, but but is it the only way? It is the only way charge can be distributed? No, it can be distributed like a, uh, on a surface also. I take it surface, a sheet of paper, and let's imagine that I have charges distributed along the surface of the paper. Then what should I do? And the way I will find out is again find the total charge on that piece of paper. And then divide that not by the volume now, because I'm not considering the thickness of it, right? Not by the volume, but by the area. So now I can find a, a surface charge density. This is volume charge density, the surface charge density. And what is this? That is linear charge density. So I take a line, a line of charge. Okay? Then I find how much charge is there. In that in the piece, the segment, and I then I divide that by the length of it, then I get linear charge density. So it's, these are not um, these are not uh, new ideas. These are ideas you may have come across and you may be using in your real life also, but you wouldn't have thought too much about it. For example, when I talk about linear charge density, then you might think, well, why? Like in, in real life, you'll always have some kind of a uh, you know, like uh, area, for example, like if this is a line, I said the charges are continuously distributed along this line, then you'll say, fine, like it's, yeah, maybe it's going long, long and long, but you still have this, this dimension, right? It's not just the x, x, x axis alone, but you also have something along the y axis. So then it is actually area, and why do you call it as a, um, as a linear thing? Well, it is like this, when you go to a store, when you go to a cloth store and buy cloth, how do you buy that? Okay, uh, give me one meter of the cloth, give me 1.5 meter of the cloth, give, give me 2 meters of the cloth. cloth. So does it mean that the cloth is going to be a, just a thread with, I know, with no width at all? That's what you're going to, uh, going to buy? No, the cloth will have, the cloth will have, The clock will have a width, but then you you talk only about the length. Why? Because the width is constant. The width doesn't change here. So if the, if the width doesn't change, then you are not really bothered about it basically. Okay. So in one meter, if one meter costs a certain amount of money. You consider when you say one meter cloth, you are not getting this this part. You are actually getting this part, this area. Okay. So when you say two meters, then you're actually getting this part, not just this length. Okay. So you generally ignore this because you know that this is going to be constant. Okay. So that's not going to change depending on the length you buy. Right. So again, uh, when you go to a clock store and then say, give me 
one meter of this cloth and give me two meters of this cloth. Then you are actually talking about linear cloth density, I should say, or linear price density, I should say. Okay? You will have one meter could be 100 rupees and for two meters you will pay 200 rupees. It doesn't mean that you only have one dimension, you have two dimensions there. But then you are talking only about that. So likewise, when you talk about aerial uh, density, does it mean that there is no volume for it? For example, when you talk, when you talk about this, okay? Um, for example, when you go buy tiles, okay, uh, in a, in a shop for, for your floor, then they will charge you per tile, right? They will charge you per, per tile. So it's like that. So does it mean that they talk about areas? Okay, how many how many uh, uh, tiles you need? Like so, the, the tile is like you know, uh, half a foot by half a foot. Uh, then you say like I need ten by ten or something like that. Then like, you know like you you are going to get four hundred such such things half a foot tiles or something, right? So but that. You don't consider the thickness there, right? Because why? The thickness is constant. You don't bother with thickness now. You know that the thickness is the thickness doesn't have a very serious impact on the price. So, so in the case of a tile, the tiles are marbles, or granites, like you're talking about the area, basically. Uh, and in the case of you know cloths or even you know uh, iron rods, iron rods are clearly like this. When you build a, a building, uh, say like 10 meters, 20 meters, okay, so, so it, it's like this. And again, your volume. So when you talk about linear charge density, I'm ignoring the, all the other things. And when will that happen? Only when you have something like a, a rod, something like a wire, something like a line, whose uh, uh, area, the cross-sectional area you can kind of ignore and focus only on the length. So there you would be going for um, a linear density. And then when you have an area like tiles and stuff, granites and marbles and stuff, then you would ignore the thickness because you would be going only for the area involved. So then you say uh, per square meter this is it. Okay. Uh, this is the price. For, uh, Per square meter, uh, per, per square foot, this is it. So that's for the aerial uh, density, uh, surface density, and volume density. Volume density is the density that you know. Okay. And can you go for the fourth dimension? Yes, you can, but you don't find anything in real life which, uh, no, which, uh, which is of interest to you in in four dimensions. Three dimensions are enough for you. So you will have three densities basically. Okay? One is the linear density, which involves only one dimension, linear density. And second one is surface density or aerial density. I'll call it a surface density. And then third one is volume density. So linear density, surface density, and volume density. So, and there are symbols that we use for these. For linear density, we use lambda. Okay. And for surface density, we use sigma. And then for volume, we use rho. So this is, this is typically a symbol used for mass density also. Right? Uh, so linear density, L name lambda L L surface density S sigma S S sigma and the volume density you know we started using it, this rho thing for a long time so we continue to use this okay. uh, so clearly uh, if I have lamb suppose like I have I, I have a line like this I have a I have a line like this, it's just continuous charge distribution, it's continuously distributed charge here. Suppose I want the charge for this length, say maybe this is a delta L, the length. 
what's the amount of charge contained in that length? Then the charge here, Q or delta Q, can be written as lambda, which is a linear charge density, multiplied by delta. If it is uniformly distributed, then this is how we do it. Likewise, I have an area like this. So charge is continuously distributed here. Continuous charge distribution. Okay. Suppose I want the amount of charge in a small area. So let's say this is my area. Okay. Now I want to find uh, this is my delta S, okay? This is my delta S. It's a very small area. I want to find the amount of charge in that area. Then what would I do? So delta Q here is equal to sigma, the surface charge density of that surface, multiplied by delta S. Right? Okay. So, again, and if I have a volume, volume and then suppose I want to charge in this small volume here. So this is my delta V. My delta V. Then what's the charge in that volume, small volume? Which is delta Q, small charge, not the total charge, just the charge contained in that small volume now. So that is equal to rho into delta. And if you want the entire the charge in that line, so then how do we do that? It's very simply. I'll calculate one delta, you know, uh, uh, the charge in this area, in this, uh, in this length, this length, this length, and I'll sum it all up, right? I'll sum it all. I take small length and I'll calculate the amount of charge in that length. And then likewise, I'll have one more small length, one more small length, one more small length. Then I find the charge for each small length, each delta Q I will find. Then if I add it all up, then I'm going to have the charge in this length. Okay? This, this delta Q, this delta Q, this delta Q, this delta Q will give me Q. Okay? So this results in this results in the total charge Q is actually equal to sum of all this delta Q, right? The sum of all the delta Q. All this mode, which is equal to the sum of sum of lambda delta n. Okay. So likewise, the total charge in the surface again is equal to Q is equal to the sum of all the small delta Qs, which are like this area, and like this area, another area, another area, like I'm going to add all of it together. So that would give me sigma sum of this and delta s and add it all up okay. and likewise this gives me q the total charge the total charge in this volume and the entire volume is going to be sum of the charge in the individual tiny volumes okay so that is the sum of all the delta Qs. So, rho delta V. Okay. So, this is. So, this, uh, this is the idea that we would be uh, using uh, uh, down the line. We may not be using this idea immediately, but this is what I want you to keep in mind. So, uh, it's like oh, we have moved from discrete charges to continuous charge distribution and in continu continuous charge distribution we have three types one is the linear charge distribution and then the area or the surface charge distribution and also the volume charge distribution okay. and the way we calculate uh, the amount of charge in any small area is by taking the 
surface charge density and multiply that with the area that you are interested in. That will give you the amount of charge in that area. Same thing goes for length and volume. So this is the idea you have to remember and we will be revisiting it later. Because from point charges, from discrete charges, we are moving to continuous charge distribution. So it will make uh, much more sense to you. Why? Because if you want to find the electric field due to, say, this surface of charges, let's say I want to find the field here at this point, then how do you do that? Well, I have to take each individual charge and then find the field due to each of those charges, sum it all up vectorially. It's going to be very tedious for me. I don't even know how many are there, first of all. If, it, if you look at a, a metal plate and charge it, then I know that the amount of charge that is there. But if you want to find the field here, I have to, to take into account each and every electron there and where it is. And I need to find the field due to each and every one of them and vectorially add them all to find the net field there. So it's going to be a little complicated actually. The same idea that we used for this, but here it was easy, only a few of them. But the moment you talk about continuous charge distribution, which is what you see in real life, then you are in some kind of trouble. Okay? It's not that you can't do it, you should be able to do it, but then it's going to be extremely complex. So oh, to help us with that process, the continuous charge distribution idea is going to be useful. We'll see how useful it is going to be a little later. But I want you to keep this in mind. Okay? So we're talking about continuous charge, continuous charge distribution. Okay. Hope this makes sense to you. The next topic that we are going to talk about is Gauss's law. Again, this is not something new. This is something that we already talked about. Okay? If you remember, when we are talking about the electric flux, we came up with the idea of, uh, of what being constant in it, right? So we said electric flux is kind of the number of rays, I mean, approximately. Uh, a rough uh, definition of that is this, like if you take a, let's say if you take a point charge and if you start drawing a number of uh, lines, then you can call it as the collection of those lines as the electric flux. Okay? Um, and then we said that though that number will not change uh, where you are, right? Whether you are here, suppose we draw this, this line, this line, this line, and maybe this line, this line something like this. If this is charge Q, then I've drawn three. Six, eight lines are drawn now. So, whether I take this sphere or this sphere or this sphere or any other sphere, the number of lines which are coming out of the sphere is always eight in my picture. Okay. But then we also say that somebody else may draw a different picture for the same charge. Let's say it is one microcoulomb, one microcoulomb charge. So you may draw, say, 50 lines for this. But then that 50 will not change regardless of the size of the sphere. That's what we, we saw. Whether it can be a sphere or it can even be a box. So think about it, okay? Be a box. Again. Okay. The number of lines that are coming out of the box would still be 8 in my case and maybe 50 in your case, if you are drawn. 
um, 50 lines from this. Okay, it is like keeping, keeping a charge in some kind of a closed uh, surface, right? There is some kind of a container. So the container is a sphere, yeah, 50 lines will come out. But then, if the container is uh, the box, then also 50 lines will come out. Okay, then if it is uh, an irregular shopping bag covered on all sides, the number of lines which are coming out of the shopping bag or a school bag, you take the chart and put it in your school bag, which is neither a square, uh, neither a box, uh, nor, a, uh, nor a sphere. So, uh, even if you take the chart and put that inside your school bag, then the number of lines coming out would be the same, right? whether it is 8 uh, in my case or 50 in your case, right? So that's the idea. So that's the idea. That is that's kind of Gauss law. We'll, we'll explain it a little later. But but if you can understand that part, then you can understand Gauss's law as I explained it to you. But the only difference between my picture and your picture is that I come up with eight lines and you come up with fifty lines or hundred lines or whatever. So we wanted some number which would not vary for you and me, right? And we can use that as the identifier for the flux. And also that depends on the charge that you keep inside. Okay. And that number, we remember, that is Q by epsilon naught, right? Q by epsilon naught was a number. Why? We said this, if this is a point charge here, then E here, E can be given by the expression, okay, 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught to Q by r squared, then I take Q this way and then sigma epsilon naught and 4 pi r squared is how I'm going to write this then 4 pi r squared is actually the surface area of the sphere I'm considering matter so I take it and then I take E and this I call this as S okay and if I take it as S and that is going to give me Q by epsilon naught now notice that this S is like this E into S it will always be equal to Q by epsilon naught. Notice if this S increases, that is R increases, E must come down. It's obvious, right? R increases, which means that you are further away from the charge. So the, the electric field must be smaller because you are going away from it. So if S increases, E must come down. If E increases, S must be small. But this E into S combination, E multiplied by S combination must always be equal to Q by epsilon naught. Okay? So this is the surface area. So I mean the Gauss, Gauss law comes from this idea basically. Uh, there is a rigorous mathematical proof for it. Uh, even though we have done this for a sphere, it is true for any surface. And that is what I meant when I said that you can even use a box. Yeah, pencil box. You keep the charge inside the pencil box. Still, the number of lines coming out of the charge will be 50. They will be coming through the pencil box. Right? Uh, like this. All the lines have to come out of the pencil box now. Or if I put it in a, in a, in a ball uh, inside the, say, the basketball, then also 50 lines must be coming out of it. Or uh, inside your school bag, then also 50 lines must be coming out of it. So, so it does not depend on the it does not depend on the shape of the of the container now, right? The container can be a sphere or a box or a bag, or any regular shaped container doesn't matter. But the number of lines which are coming out of that charge will always be the same, right? So that's the idea. So that is what uh, Gauss says. What Gauss says is that the electric flux. The electric flux coming out of a closed surface will be equal to the net charge inside that surface divided by epsilon naught. Okay? So the definition is this. So what is Gauss's law? Gauss's law states that the electric flux, the net electric flux. The net electric flux 
Notice coming out. Or, or I say through the surface is better because it can come out and go inside also. The net electric flux through through a closed surface. A closed surface is equal equal to Q and or divided by epsilon naught. Or they call it as Q E and C. See? And it's enclosed by the surface. Okay? It's equal to the charge enclosed by the surface divided by epsilon naught. So Q E and C is actually charge enclosed by the surface. So the sphere encloses the charge or a box encloses the charge. The school bag encloses the charge. That divided by epsilon naught. Okay. So that is what it says. Okay. And how do you write the electric flux actually? The electric flux is written by uh, the sum of E dot ds, right? Remember? Sum of E dot ds. E, you take, okay, it's like this. Find E here and then take this small area and then find E here, take this small area, find E here, take this small area and add it all. That is, the E dot ds is equal to the amount of flex coming through this, coming through this, coming through this, right? So you find the flex for this one, this area, this area, this area. And all these small areas, add them all up. And that's a total flux. And that would be equal to Q enclosed. Q enclosed by epsilon naught. Okay. Or this is one way of writing it, but discrete uh, surfaces. But it can also be written as integral closed E dot ds equal to Q and to epsilon naught. This is the integral form. The summation form, this is an integral form when the area, the DS area, the small area is almost approaching zero. So you are taking the flex through very small areas, very, 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 very small areas. You go to add them all together, then you have this E dot DS equal to Q and close epsilon naught. Okay? So, so this is the Gauss law. The Gauss says that the net electric flux through a closed surface is equal to the charge enclosed in this by a surface divided by epsilon naught. That is Gauss's law. Then what is electric flux? This is electric flux. Or no, so this is fine. Fine. This is electric flux, the scalar quantity, the sum of the electric flux through each small areas. Area of that enclosed area, this area, this area, this area, this area, this area. Sum it all up, then you are going to get Q enclosed divided by epsilon naught. So this is Gauss's law. Okay. Uh, uh, I mean, if I have positive charge, you see, then flex will be coming out. A positive charge. Suppose I have negative charge, I have minus Q here. Then what happens? Then it will end. So if I take this one, this is the surface of the tape, then you see I'm going to have flex going into that area. But in this case, flex coming out of the area, depending on whether it is positive or negative charges enclosed in it. Okay. Suppose, suppose I have both positive and negative charges inside this area. Suppose I have Q here, then I have Q minus, right? Minus Q. Let's say I also have plus Q in this, here, somewhere here. Okay, so plus capital Q in this. So what happens now? So from plus Q also, there will be lines coming out now. Okay, so 
they are coming out like this. From Q also, they are coming out like this. So, there are certain number of lines which are coming out and there are certain number of lines which are going in. So, the net will be the algebraic sum of these. Right? If 50 lines come out and 50, 100 lines go in, then it is actually 100, uh, 50 lines going in. So, that's the flux. So, what's the net flux? 50 lines are coming out and 100 lines are going in. So, the net flux is 50 lines going in. Okay, or if I take it, 30 lines come out and, and then 70 lines go in. Then what's the net flux? 40 lines going in. So, that difference. So, that's a net flux. Okay? So, but the point is, when I have these two things like this, minus charge and plus charge here, it's a smaller charge, it's a bigger charge or something. You see, if we take this place, this area, if we take this point, you see, electric field due to this capital Q is going to be greater, EQ is going to be greater than electric field due to this small charge, E minus Q now. Okay, so there will be a net field pointing outwards. But if you take, if you, maybe if you go here, it's so close to this one and maybe it's farther from here. So in, the, in this case, the electric field due to the minus Q may be greater and then the electric field due to plus Q. You see, here the lines will be going net in. Here the electric field line will be coming out, net out. So the flux through this area will be different from the flux through this area. Okay? This can be, because this is, let's say this is 70 here minus 70 and this is a plus 40 or something then you get minus 30 going in right my net field will be in this direction minus 30 newton per coulomb but here it could be different right? it can be plus 50 you see so so at any particular area this could be different when you have multiple charges inside but if you sum it all up, this minus 30 and, and this plus, plus 40 or order 50, and if you sum it all, all the, all the flex and all the area, then you are going to get this value. The net charge. What is the net charge enclosed? This is plus Q, this is minus Q. That's the net charge divided by epsilon naught. Okay, so that would be the total flux. True that sir. Some places the flux is going in and some places the flux is going out. You are going to find a net flux through the area, And that is given by this expression Q minus Q by epsilon naught. Because Q minus Q is a charge enclosed. You have positive charge also, you have negative charge also in that uh, 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 enclosed surface. So, there is a net charge, capital Q minus small Q. And that's the net charge, that's the Q enclosed, divided by epsilon naught. That is equal, that will be equal to the amount of flux coming out or, or going in to that surface. Okay? So, so that gives you, uh, that makes you think of uh, something else. Suppose I have, I have a surface. Suppose I have a surface. There is no net flux out. So I'll say if I, I Phi is equal to zero. There is no net flux out of this. So does it mean there is no charge inside? No, I cannot conclude that. All I can conclude is that there is no net charge inside. Okay? So there can be a, there can be a plus Q here and then there can also be a minus Q there. You see, the charge, the flux due to this plus Q is Q by epsilon naught. And then the charge, uh, the flux due to the minus Q is minus Q by epsilon naught. They are equal and opposite. So the net charge enclosed is zero. So Q enclosed is equal to Q plus Q minus Q. So, so that is equal to zero. There are two charges inside. But there is no net charge. Okay. 
So when you calculate this, suppose somebody gives you a box, okay? Suppose they give you a box like this. They tell you that I am calculating the flex through this box and I find that the net flex on the surface, or through the surface of this box is zero. That's what he says. I have calculated the flex on the surface, this surface, this surface, this surface, this surface, this surface. This surface. I have added them all together, then I get the net flex value as zero. Can I conclude that there is no charge inside? No. All I can conclude is that there is no net charge inside. I cannot conclude that there is no charge at all inside. There, there could be an equal amount of positive and equal amount of negative charges inside, which also will result in zero flux, zero net flux. Okay. So you, are, you have to remember that it is always Q enclosed by epsilon. So that is one idea. Then another thing that you need to remember, this is like this. Okay, suppose I have two charges, plus Q, and then I have, say, maybe plus Q, capital Q. Now I'm going to take the surface like this. So this is my surface. Okay, but you see. The, uh, the surface contains only this charge, this Q epsilon naught. But notice that here at this point or any other point, you see, there would be there would be field due to this also, right? This this charge also. But that won't affect your calculation. If you take this one, the flux through this surface, the net flux through this surface. The net flux through the surface. So phi E is still going to be equal to Q by epsilon naught, and this Q would not even be here when we consider. Why? Think about it. Suppose there are lines from this charge. Okay. Let's, let's there are three lines. I mean, it has so many other lines actually. And then let's say well, if three go through this bag, I've got. Okay. But what has happened here? See, there are three lines entering here, and then there are three lines leaving here. So, how many other lines that enter will be equal to the number of lines that leave this one? So, what's the net lines coming from there? Nothing. So these. 3 enter, 3 leave. What is the net? 0. Okay. So there is no net flex in this due to this charge. But what about this? Put here. Always be this one. Going out. Okay. Always be going out. Okay. So there will be a net flex only due to this charge, not due to this charge. Because when you keep the, keep the closed surface here, and if you take a charge which is outside the surface, there will be flex entering from this charge, all right, understandably, it will enter, but it can also leave. So the number of lines that enter will be equal to the number of line, lines that leave. So the net flex due to this charge on the surface or through the surface will be zero. So the flux through a closed surface is going to come only from the charges inside. The net flux through the surface can come only from the charges kept inside the surface. Okay. So that's the that's the idea. Okay. If you understand this idea, then there is one thing. One more thing that I need to talk about. That is this. Okay, I have a closed surface. Let's say like this is the let's say this is surface, right? This is surface. This surface. Now it has two sides. Okay? 
and you know that that I would have is e dot ds to find the flux e dot z delta s. So that is that will give me is delta delta phi small flux through this surface. Right? So I, I find the e value and then I find multiply that by delta s. But then I'm going to assign a vector to it. Remember from the previous uh, discussions that we had. So you have an area. The area is not a vector, but then I'm going to assign a normal uh, to that area, and the direction of the normal is the direction of the area. That's what we said when we introduced this concept a few uh, videos ago. Okay. So now I have this area. Now you see, if I take this side, the normal is out like this. But if we take this side, the normal is this way. So which direction should I assign? For example, I hope you understand the same. Suppose if I take this one, the area, we draw from here, the normal is this side. Like, and if we see from the other side, the normal is this side. So I have an area delta is. So now I'm going to assign a direction to it. I'm going to assign this direction or this direction to this area. I am going to assign the outward direction for this closed surface. Suppose if this is a closed surface, it's a closed surface. Take this for example. So this is it, right? This is size. This, this is an area. Now it's a closed surface. This box is a closed surface. So this has an area here. But which direction am I going to assign? I am not going to assign this direction. I am going to assign this direction. It is always the outward normal to that surface. That's what I will take. So then what is the direction of delta s? Delta s direction is the direction of the outward normal of the enclosed surface. So if I have a surface like this and closed surface, so if this is a small surface in the closed surface in the bag, then you see I have, I have the outward normal, the normal has to come out. So this is a direction of the area, small area. So if I take this area, this is the normal. This is the direction of the area. If I take this area, this is the normal. If I take this area, this is the nor normal to that area. This one, this is a normal. This one, this is a normal. This side, this is a normal to the surface. So this, the, no the outward normal gives you the direction of the surface. Even though you can draw normal on both sides of the surface, when you close the surface, so there is an outward normal. That's the direction of the surface. So when you take the sir, uh, direction and convert the area into a vector, and then you get the E value of the charge at this place, that will also have a direction, then you do a, a dot product, and that will give you the flex through the small surface. Okay. The flex through this particular surface. Now, if you add the flex through all these small surfaces in the closed surface, small surfaces, the flex through each small surface in the closed surface, if I add it all together, I'm going to get the net flex through the enclosed surface. And the net flex through the enclosed surface, not the small, the not the flex the small surfaces, the net flex through the entire enclosed surface, the sum of all these small flexes will be equal to the charge enclosed within that surface divided by epsilon naught. So that is Gauss's law. Hope it's clear to you.